It starts complicated, but it gets simple really fast. Hello, I'm Emmett Ryan and welcome to Ball in Europe, where today it's very much a video for those of you who might have come across European basketball more this past summer with the Olympics, and you might be thinking, wow, like this, these guys are good, these guys can play, but where can I watch the best of them play? And the answer is EuroLeague. So in this video, I'm going to explain to you all what EuroLeague is, how it works, and just why we all love it. Uh, if you haven't already though, please subscribe. It's really, really big help for the channel and always is a big boost. But let's get right into it. So EuroLeague is quite simple once you get to the basics of it. But working out who's actually in is a little bit more complicated. So it's not like the NBA where everybody's permanent, but it's not like, say, football where it's all promotion relegation. There's some teams who are permanent members. There's 12 of them. So Spain has the most. They have three in Basconia, FC Barcelona and Real Madrid. Greece and Turkey have two each. Olympiakos and Panathinaikos from Greece and then Anadolu Efes and Fenerbahce from Turkey. And then there's five other teams from different nations. So there's Bayern Munich, there's Asvel, there's Maccabi Tel Aviv, there's Olympia Milano and there's Zalgiris Kaunas. But that still leaves six of the 18 teams to fill. So those teams are typically on short-term licenses. So they're of two or one years and they can retain those essentially by getting to the playoffs, but are also meeting certain criteria EuroLeague sets down, which are very boring and not very clear to the average person, but not very important right now. Those teams at present are Alba Berlin, Corvina Zvezda, Monaco, as you can see, I'm reading off the list to make sure I get it right for this season, Partizan, Virtus Bologna, and the last one, and probably the most important for this video, is Paris Basketball. So there's three French teams in it this year, but only Asvel's guaranteed its spot. And of the three French teams, Monaco and Paris, essentially it's, if you make the playoffs, you're guaranteed your spot next season. That's one of the sort of the qualifiers. The other big one is essentially winning EuroCup just to get into the campaign. That's how Paris are in this season. So Paris won EuroCup, which is the second tier competition, but not the only one in Europe. And that was, got it an automatic spot in EuroLeague. And they replaced Valencia, who were in it last year. But Valencia didn't come last. Valencia came 13th of 18 teams. And there were other teams who had short-term licenses below them. But basically, it was a case of who's most willing to move and also who was your league most interested in not having. And they already have three teams in Spain. Valencia isn't too far from Barcelona. So in terms of media markets, it wasn't that important. So there are corporate implications as well as basketball implications. That's the complicated part. Now we get to the fun, cool bits. So yeah, the regular season is by far and away the best I've seen for a pan-European competition in literally any sport ever. And I love my sports because everybody plays everybody. It's run essentially like a national league, even though it's across the whole of Europe. And so everybody plays each other home and away. So it's one game in your place against everybody and one game in the other everybody else's place. And it's fantastic. It means that there's real parity in terms of the scheduling. Like in the NBA, you might play you play your divisional rival four times, your other conference rival three times, and the teams from the other conference two times. Which don't get me wrong, that's a lot of games. But it's not the same schedule. Like the Boston Celtics and the LA Lakers have a great rivalry. Play each other twice, so the same as Euroleague teams do, but have wildly different schedules. So this parity really means that no one can complain about oh, they had a tougher road, or they had this, or they had that. Everybody plays the same teams in the same circumstances. That's great. The playoffs, then, are where things really spice up. The regular season ends in April. The playoffs start in, at the end of April and move into the beginning of May. There's four of them, four best-of-five series. But there's ten teams in the postseason, because one thing the EuroLeague has taken from the NBA is the play-in concept, and it works exactly like the NBA concept. So at the end of the regular season, 7th plays 8th, and 9th plays 10th. The winner of 7th, 8th, they're straight through to play the 2 seed in the playoffs. 9th, 10th, winner of that, goes to where the loser of the 7th, 8th, and then the winner of that plays the 1 seed in the playoffs and the playoffs are wild best of five series so if you the higher seed you are obviously is home court two at home two away and then back at the home court of the higher seed if required and last year we had an absolute belter of a postseason it was just thrilling to watch we had the first time ever where the lower seed won a game five lower seeds have won series before but we had two examples last season where the lower seed won game five and that had never happened before in EuroLeague. And that leads to the final four, 
which is exactly like the NCAA Final Four. It's played on a Friday and a Sunday. Semi-finals on a Friday, final on a Sunday. There is a third place game, but we don't like to talk about that because it's dull and no one likes it. Uh, but essentially, it's played again at a predetermined venue. Now, the venue for last season was Berlin. The year before was Kaunas in Lithuania. They try and move it about quite a bit. Like, you'd rarely have the same country two years in a row. There was a case during the pandemic, but again, that was because of the pandemic. They try and make sure that all parts of Europe get to see the absolute best players come together. And sometimes you can have a season where you get to the Final Four and it's in your home court. That happened with Real Madrid not too long ago. They won it in 2015 in Madrid in front of their home fans. So you, And Fenerbahce uh, did it a couple of years later in Istanbul as well. Although that wasn't actually in their home court. That was in a different arena in Istanbul because some of you watching this may not realize this. But when I say Istanbul is big, it's really, really big. You can't imagine how ridiculously big Istanbul is. It is an enormous city. And so, yeah, yeah. So, but like, so you get that, but it's not guaranteed at all. And fans come from all over Europe to watch this, all over the world in some cases, like fans flying back in to see this. And it's a ridiculously tight, dramatic situation. Because when you think about it, you've played a 38, yeah, a, a 34 game regular season. I said 38 there. Th I probably said 38 earlier in the video as well. A 34 game regular season. And then you've played a best of five playoffs. But when deciding the title, they're single elimination games. That is rough going. But why do we all love it so much? Well, quite simply because it's great. You've noticed from a few of the names there, the same as football clubs in Europe. And the passionate nature of the fan bases that you're used to seeing in, Euro in, in European football, they pass, or soccer if you're an American or some other countries, uh, they pass over right into basketball. But you also get it in the non-traditional -fo football clubs. Zalgiris so, Kaunas, there is... A, a team in the football side there but basketball is life in Lithuania like their fans are wild the Turkish teams wild fans the Greek teams wild fans the Belgrade teams oh you better believe those fans are wild and when I say noise I mean it is out there it is up there they go crazy creating extraordinary atmospheres and people say it's like you know college sports I kind of go it's, and I've been to plenty of college football shout out to the Tigers went to see an LSU game last year it's great but I honestly think it's even better than a college football crowd. So, yeah, you get some wild crowds for, you know, basketball. 40 minutes of absolute fury every round. And I love it. Like, I'm from Dublin. We don't even have anything approaching an arena big enough to host a EuroLeague team. We don't have the basketball heritage that would lead you to have a EuroLeague team. But I love me some basketball and I love me some EuroLeague. And I, I was a newbie once too. Like, for me, I always knew about... European club basketball, don't get me wrong, but I only really became a superstar diehard back in the late 2000s. And it went from being a case of, this is great, to within a few weeks of, this is my thing, this is my jam, and I'm now running a website that's devoted to European basketball. So, and of course, a YouTube channel, which I hope you're subscribing to. So yeah, like the fans, the culture, the passion, uh, the fact that those involved in the sport aren't afraid to share their feelings openly and obviously quite a lot. Uh, sometimes those feelings are, shall we say, not ones I agree with, but I love the emotion, I love the drama. Like, you get so much heart and also great basketball, uh, being frank about it, at an hour which is, frankly, more suitable to someone on my time zone because much as I love the NBA, that's usually me watching it over breakfast the morning after because I can't stay up that late. I'm in my 40s now. So yeah, it's it's great, it's fab, and I hope you're looking forward to this coming season. Like Panathinaikos are the defending champions, but they had ended a really long drought, going all the way back to 2011 since their last title when they won it last year. And like they're loaded up, Real Madrid are loaded up, Olympiacos are loaded up, Partizan, video link somewhere there, they're loaded up. There's so many teams who have loaded up their rosters for this season. And that's the thing, the caliber just gets better and better. Because money-wise, these guys are not broke. Like, you know, this is good money. It's not quite NBA money, but compared to the bottom end of the NBA, it's actually better. And so, yeah, you're going to have some great teams, some great action, and just really different sort of basketball styles and cultures uh, coming together across the season. It's fantastic to watch. And if you haven't already, be sure to check it out online this season. And if you can, if you're not in Europe, I really couldn't recommend getting over for a game more. Like, it is a phenomenal experience. I do it a couple of times a season before getting to the Final Four. I obviously am watching games every week. And 
yeah, it's just extraordinary. But thank you for joining us on this channel. But of course, EuroLeague isn't the only place for European basketball. So this is the first in a couple of videos we're going to be doing over the next few weeks, introducing you all to basketball on the continent, because there's actually four competitions in European basketball that are pan-European. And that's only scratching the surface. There's also the National Leagues, the Cups, everything else. We're going to explain all of that in videos over the next coming weeks. But thank you for joining us. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And of course, I will see you soon.